so my name is Daniel, and thanks for coming to this presentation. And thank you, uh, John, for inviting me here. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, logic programming uh, in Scala at compile time. Um, this is actually not a new idea, and you might be wondering why should you care about logic programming at compile time in Scala. Uh, as we'll see, uh, we'll be able to use logic programming as a sort of a cleaner notation for doing uh, compile time computation. And specifically, it should make, uh, uh, make uh, uh, it should make easier to, to read and write code that uses implicits. So this is useful uh, in various contexts. Uh, when uh, uh, can be useful uh, useful in various contexts. As in, sorry, someone saying something. Oh, okay, sorry. So, uh, for example, when exploring various libraries that use implicits, something like Shapeless, or when trying to write your own code uh, that uses implicits heavily. Uh, since uh, since this is a Scala conference, how many people here like types? How many people here enjoyed the hike uh, on Saturday? <laughs> I'm sure it's related somehow. Uh, anyways, since we'll, uh, we'll be able to write fairly advanced compile time code, uh, we'll be able to design some very complicated types. Uh, types that will be able to capture sophisticated invariants about our code. Uh, ultimately, and hopefully, leading to more type safety. And so doing this by hand can be quite difficult, uh, but we'll manage to, uh, to get the compiler to construct these complicated types for us. And if not all that, I hope for at least it will be fun uh, for some definition of the word fun. Um, so uh, the plan for the talk today is uh, we're going to uh, have a quick introduction to Prolog, a language for logic programming. Uh, we'll use just the bare minimum that we'll need for, for, for describing compile time computations in Scala. After that, that I'll show how uh, the way that Prolog works is similar to the way that uh, Scala's implicit work. And we'll use this fact and translate it between Prolog and implicits. Uh, then we'll move on to some hopefully useful uh, examples of using this analogy between Prolog and implicit, uh, implicits. And I will do my best to avoid solving Sudoku as we go along. Uh, hope I'll succeed. Um, so Prolog is, is probably the most well-known language for logic programming. And that means that probably almost no one knows anything about it. Uh, so this is a style of programming where we create a database of facts and, and rules, and we can query this knowledge base uh, whether some fact, is, uh, a fact or another is true. So where a typical uh, Prolog answer, as this quote implies, is no. Uh, so this style of programming can be actually quite useful in various domains, for example, in schedule planning. So when planning a conference, for example, you should probably use Prolog, I think. Uh, but we'll, we'll abuse, uh, abuse Prolog in a fairly special way. So let's begin. So the simplest thing we can do with Prolog is to state some facts. And so the running example is going to be hobbits. Uh, so here we're saying that uh, Frodo, Bilbo, and the others are, uh, are hobbits. So each fact is a value, and this, in this case, it's a compound value where Hobbit uh, takes an argument. Uh, we call this compound value a functor, not to be confused with functors from uh, functional programming. No relation at all, I think. Um, so the functor, the functor is called Hobbit. It takes a single uh, argument, which is an atom. Um, uh, and an atom in, in Prolog can be any lowercase identifier uh, that we write. So it just becomes a, a, a constant value. And now, having declared these facts, we can query, query Prolog about them. For example, so here we're in the REPL. The question mark means that we're in the Prolog REPL. And uh, we can uh, ask whether uh, it's true that Bilbo is a hobbit. And the answer is yes, obviously, because we just stated this fact, and Prolog knows about it. And so that, that's the answer. Uh, we can also uh, ask something else. In this example, we're asking whether Gandalf is a hobbit. And obviously, the answer is no, because we didn't state such a fact. We because it's not true also, but uh, we didn't state it to Prolog, and Prolog uh, can't, uh, can't say yes uh, to, that, uh, to this query. Now, we can also use variables in, plural, in Prolog, so uh, every, uh, any uppercase identifier in Prolog is a variable. And in this case, we're asking for which values of x it is true that x is a hobbit. And now Prolog will go over uh, all the known facts, uh, facts that we have so far, and we'll find all the values of x for which this, uh, this is true. Uh, so now we can have some more complicated facts. For example, we can define uh, the parent, uh, parent relationship. So again, we, we have a, f a functor uh, called parent that this time takes two arguments, uh, uh, a parent and a child. And just like before, we can query this. Uh, uh, so this can be read as uh, Belladonna is the parent of Bilbo. 
And just as before, we can query, query this, uh, this new knowledge base for various uh, facts. For example, uh, here we're asking whether Primula is the parent of Froda, and the answer is yes, and Bilba is not the parent of Froda. So we can also use, just as before, we can use variables. So we can set the first argument as a variable, and so now we're asking uh, for which value is, uh, of x, it's true that x is a parent of Bilbo. And Prolog searches through the known facts and derives the correct answer in this case. Uh, we can also ask the opposite question. Uh, for which va values of x, it is true that, I have no idea how to pronounce it, Gerontius, Gerontius, anyone here? Which one? That would be Gerontius. So Gerontius, uh, for which values of Gerontius, uh, uh, so for which value of, of x, Gerontius is the grandparent of x. In this case, again, Prolog goes over the various facts that we know so far and uh, derives the, the correct answer. So in this case, three different values. So we see that arguments, in, in, uh, uh, arguments of effect in or, or of a relationship in Prolog are symmetric. We can query both of them uh, in the same way. So it's quite powerful because we can define one relationship but get the ver uh, various functions out of them. Now, uh, the, these were facts. Now we can move on to, uh, to rules. So a product rule is also a value. In this case, uh, the value is grandparent, the function that takes two arguments, uh, followed by a con hyphen operator that should be re read as if, and then some facts. So you can, uh, the meaning is that the left operand is true if the right uh, part is, uh, if the conjunction of the right part uh, is true as well. So uh, in this example, we're saying that A is a grandparent of B if it's true that A of is a parent of C and C is a parent of B. Uh, so uh, if, we, uh, if we provide Prolog with some concrete A and B, Prolog will try to find a value of C such that this, these two facts hold and are true. Uh, if, and if it can find the, the C, then the whole, the whole rule will be a value to true. So let's see some examples. So in this case, we're asking whether Gerontios is the parent of Sigismund, and the answer is yes, and Bilbo is not a grandparent of Froda. Uh, so in this case, what happened that when we provided uh, prologue with the two values, it, it found the appropriate C to make this uh, these two relationships true and then managed to prove the whole, uh, the whole rule uh, for us. Um, so as before, we can use, uh, can we can use variables when, when querying. So we can ask who are the, grand uh, who are the grandparents of Bilbo, and you have one result. And uh, since the variables are symmetric, we can go the other way around and uh, find all the grandchildren of uh, Gerontius. We can actually go in a, a bit further, further, and we can set both variables, uh, both arguments as variables. In this case, Prolog goes over uh, all of the known uh, facts and rules that it has in the system at this point and finds all the assignments of uh, x and y that make, uh, make this relationship true. Um, now, if we, uh, so I, I find quite quite interesting the fact that we defined one simple relationship and we get three different functions from it, but uh, it's quite special, I think. Uh, so if we actually want to find out uh, what's the relationship between uh, Bilbo and Frodo, uh, if you do care about that, um, we can, we we'll need some more rules. So here's an example of, an, uh, of another rule called siblings. So A and B are siblings if there's a C which is a parent of A and th that same C is a parent of B and A is not equal to B. And now we can remove the very, uh, we can uh, define the very intuitive relationship of first cousin once removed which is this, it's just uh, we're using the, the previously defined uh, rules and facts that we uh, had before. Um, you can figure it out how it works on the, on the real family tree or something. But now we can query this and we see that Bilbo is Frodo's uh, uh, first cousin once removed. We can also list all of, uh, uh, all of Frodo's known uh, first cousins once removed. So we have another one, but they're not as close. Um, and so these are the basics of Prolog uh, um, that well, we'll actually use uh, further on. We'll before we can continue to go back to actual, actual Scala, since it's not Prolog world, I think, uh, we'll need something, one less thing uh, from Prolog, that is lists. So lists in Prolog are written with square brackets. So this is a list with three, three values in it. And we can have queries over lists. So we can ask whether uh, some value is a member of, another, uh, of some list. So Bilbo is a member of this list, and uh, Belladon is not. We can also append lists. So this works as follows. So we, uh, we have an, uh, an ver a variable as the third argument. And so uh, a Prolog tries to find an assignment of this variable that, that, uh, that is the concatenation of the, two, uh, of the two first arguments. In this case, this is the result. 
But as we've seen so far, uh, so far uh, prolog queries are symmetrical, so we, any argument can be a variable. In this case, we can, uh, for example, set the first argument as a variable. And now it finds this, an assignment of this argument that makes uh, uh, this value concatenated uh, with this value uh, uh, to uh, give the result of, of this bigger value. And so in this case, this is the answer. And so this same relationship gave it, gave gives us a uh, list abstraction. So we have one definition, but we have multiple functions yet again. And it's not actually some sort of dark magic that uh, we can achieve on our own, and we can actually define these rules on our own. So uh, this is the definition of the member relationship. So we're using pattern matching. So this pipe syntax deconstructs a list into a head and a tail. So we're saying that uh, H is a member of a list with H at the head because, well, H is there and it, it's a member. Uh, otherwise, we have another uh, we have a rule that says an element is is a member of a list made of head and the tail if uh, the element is is a member of the of the tail. And so this is basically a recursive definition that forces prolog to go over the list until it fin finds the element or fails and says no. Um, we can also define the append uh, append relationship. It's quite mind-bending, and I won't try to explain it here. It's also recursive and kind of weird. But these th three lines actually give us the powerful relationship from, from before. Um, so we can, if you care about it enough, you can try and figure it out on your own. Uh, the full code uh, is available uh, in the repo. And that's all the, pretty much all the product we'll need today. So we can move on to um, Scala now. So my aim now is to show how similar uh, Scala's type system is to Prolog, uh, specifically how programming with implicits uh, is not that different from programming in Prolog. Uh, and actually the connection between type systems and logic is very, very deep, but I won't be doing anything, I won't be saying anything about it now. So, um, so when, when we declare in Scala something as implicit, it becomes known to the compiler. Uh, so when we, when we ask the compiler to resolve something implicitly for us, it will search at compile time through all the implicitly known definitions and try to de derive a value of the correct type for us. And this should sound familiar since it's pretty much the way Prolog works as we just uh, seen in the, pre in the previous section. So to make the analogy more concrete, let's actually uh, start, uh, try to translate between the two. So, so Prolog atoms uh, become simple uh, Scala types. Uh, so an atom becomes just a trait. Um, compound terms uh, that take arguments, so in this case the parent relationship that has two arguments, become uh, compound, uh, uh, compound Scala types, types that they take uh, argu type arguments uh, themselves. So if a prolog program runs over prolog values, uh, a Scala logic program will run over types. So that is we're aiming uh, at logic programming over the type system. So that's kind of the goal uh, we're trying to achieve. So we can state facts. Uh, so effect uh, becomes an, an implicit definition, so uh, which should make sense because, uh, as I said in the uh, just a moment ago, uh, anything declared that, that is declared as implicit becomes known to the compiler. So uh, but while by declaring uh, this value as implicit, it, it becomes a fact that the compiler can operate on, um, just like the prolog knowledge base. Uh, and the last part we need are rules. So these become uh, chained implicit. So to prove that A and B are siblings, we need to know something about A and B, also implicitly because we need it at compile time. Uh, and we'll see an example shortly. So now that we have both facts and rules, we can query them. So uh, the equivalent of querying the prolog REPL is asking for implicit resolution. So when we ask the compiler for an implicit value, it, it will for force the compiler to go over all, through all the known implicits uh, that, we, that, we know, that we have so far in the program and uh, come up with an answer, just like in Prolog. And so let's try to actually convert the, the Hobbit example into, uh, into actual Scala code. So uh, first, uh, because Scala is statically typed, uh, we'll have to declare all of our types up front. So all of our atoms, atoms uh, will, uh, will be uh, traits that we define up front. Uh, one for each uh, for each value. I also have to declare all the possible compound times. So uh, this just mirrors the prolog definition. So each argument we had uh, previously in prolog, uh, each argument becomes uh, a type argument, type parameter for our trait. And we can now declare some facts. So we start with the prolog code uh, and we'll translate it step by step. 
And it's a pretty mechanical process, so it shouldn't be that complicated. So first step is capitalization and, and brackets, so like this. Uh, next, we mar mark everything as implicit. Now, the names of the implicits uh, don't mean anything for a logic program. Uh, this is, they're just noise that Scala forces us to write in order uh, to be able to actually have a valid Scala definition. Uh, we also need to provide some, some values for these definitions, but since at the moment we don't really care about values, since we only operate on types, we'll provide some dummy values. And that's it. That's that we managed to state some facts uh, to the compiler. Uh, it's a bit noisier compared to Prolog, slightly so, uh, but it's good enough, and we can work with that. And now we can try to convert uh, a rule uh, into our Scala Prolog thingy. So we again start with the Prolog definition. So first step is capitalization in brackets. Next, we re reverse the if operator and rename it to implicit. Uh, now this is almost looks like valid Scala, but we'll just need to kind of add the, the, the noise that makes it a, a, an actual legal Scala definition. So we add that. And once again, uh, the names of the implicit don't really matter, but we have to declare all, all of our variables up front, because again, Scala is statically typed. <coughs> um, but still, if you kind of squint hard enough, it resembles uh, the prolog definition. So we just have to read it backwards. So we start, uh, A is the grandparent of B, if this holds. And to complete the definition, we'll need a dummy value, just as before. And now we can qu uh, query, our, uh, query our knowledge base. So just uh, in Prolog, we query the REPL. Now we'll query the compiler and try to compile something. So now we're asking the compiler, is it true that Bel uh, Belladonna is the parent of Bilbo? And that's the result. Uh, the compiler found the value of the right type uh, for us. And this is equ equivalent to, to Prolog saying yes. Uh, not as compact or short, but still gets the point across. Uh, gets the point across. And we can make a failing query, for example. So in this case, we're asking whether Bilbo is a parent of, uh, of Frodo. And it fails to compile, So, uh, which means that there isn't an implicit value that, that uh, makes, uh, makes this uh, uh, definition hold. And this is, so a compilation error is equivalent to prologs no. Uh, we can also query rules. For example, we can uh, ask whether uh, Mirabella is a grandparent of Frodo. And, and the result is yes. We managed to compile, and here's the value. So that's a yes, but the other uh, query fails and because we failed to compile and it's equiv equivalent to no. Now in Prolog we had variables, so we can, uh, can we use variables here? So naively, since everything in Scala kind of boils down to an underscore, we can try using an underscore here in the middle. Um, and, and we can even run it and it compiles. But as you can see here, we don't actually have an answer because the underscore just remained as is. Uh, so it's, so the compiler is telling us that, yes, I can find a value that proves, that, that matches this, this shape, but uh, I'm not going to give you the specific type that, that actually satisfies it. So that's kind of, uh, kind of uh, that, that's a problem, because in Scala there's no straightforward way of saying, I want to fix this type argument, but please infer the other. Uh, so, so this is kind of the first point where, where we start the diverging from actual prologue. Uh, but it's possible to circumvent uh, this issue, like, uh, like so. So we need to define a helper ma method that takes an A value. Uh, and that's the compiler to derive a grandparent, a, 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 to derive whether it's true that a, a is a grandparent of B uh, as a result. So by provi providing an A value, the compiler infers the right type for A. And then we'll leave B unspecified and let the compiler actually infer it uh, itself. So we've broken Prolog's argument symmetry, uh, but it works. So now when we actually query, uh, so we, we uh, have to provide a dummy value, but uh, the result is that we actually managed to find a value of B and actually get, and get a real result for, for our query. Uh, so this allows us to find all the grandchildren. If we want to go the, in the opposite direction, we'll need an, another helper. So in this case, we're doing the same thing, but we're uh, giving B and expecting A to be inferred. And we can compile, and it doesn't work. Uh, which may seem strange, but it actually has a reasonable explanation. So uh, if you know how Scala resolves implicits, then uh, we can actually see the problem in the definition of grandparents. So Scala resolves implicits, uh, implicits from left to right, or top down in this case. Uh, and so when we're trying to find uh, Frodo's uh, grandparent, uh, which is B in this case, we need to first provide an implicit for a parent A of C. But at this point, we know nothing about A and C, so any implicit that has uh, a, a, any, a, any parent implicit will, will be fine here. But uh, since there are many 
uh, pairs of parents, uh, parents and ch children in, in our definitions. Th there will be uh, many implicits that fi fit here. So we get an ambiguous implicit on our way uh, of inferring the whole thing. And once we get an impl ambiguous implicit, uh, compilation fails. Uh, but we can work around this limitation uh, with another rule. So this is pretty much the same thing as before, but we swap the order of the implicits that we're uh, trying to query. So in this case, we're saying that, uh, so we're trying to find the grandparent of Frodo, so we're setting a B here, and there's only one parent of Frodo, so th this gives us C, and then we can uniquely infer uh, the, uh, the next, next level after it. And it works now, so now we can find the grandparent of Frodo, and we get some result, which is uh, Mirabella. And the next question is, what, what happens if we have multiple grandchildren? So in this case, it fails. But it doesn't fail because there aren't any grandchildren. It fails because there are many grandchildren. And uh, at some point, uh, the implicit resolution chain will, will hit the, the various grandchildren of Gerontius. And again, we'll have ambiguous implicits. So this is a very serious limitation compared uh, to Prolog, uh, where we naturally, naturally handle any number of results. And it significantly limits the sort of uh, the kind of problems that we can solve at compile time pro uh, at com with our compile time prolog, uh, but it won't stop us trying. So we can move on uh, to lists. So as we've seen, prolog values are types in our Scala analogy with implicits. So this means that a list of prolog values is a list of Scala types, and, as, uh, and there's a name for such a thing. It's called H lists. Uh, that is het heterogeneous lists, and we, uh, we can think of them as sort of tuples of any length uh, that are statically checked at compile time. So we can see how we define them. So this is quite similar to the definition of a, of a regular linked list. So we have a, uh, a case for an empty list and a case for a head and a tail. But unlike the uh, regular linked list, we have more types here. So we're uh, ascribing a type to the head and a separate type to the tail. Uh, so it will be qu quite a bit easier to follow with an example. So we have here a, th a list of three, of three values. Uh, each value has its own type. And we can see that the type signature records uh, the full type information about each of the elements in the H list. Uh, and notice how the values, the value here mimics the, uh, the actual type that we, are, uh, that, that we have as a result. And that's a very common pattern when doing type level programming, uh, kind of following with uh, the type system with our values, and it will be useful later on. And just like in Prolog, we can perform actions over our uh, over our, the uh, an H list. So uh, these are the types that allow us to query whether some element is a member uh, of some H list, and this one allows us to append one list to another. And we can implement the same rules uh, as the ones we've seen in Prolog, and the translation uh, kind of it, it kind of mimics the, the whole thing exactly. So I'll skip the implementation, and you can see the full thing uh, in the repo for this, for this talk. So we're now ready for some uh, real-world examples. <coughs> so as you can see from this quote, this probably wasn't intended uh, to begin with. But it's actually quite amazing uh, the sort of things we can achieve with our newfound prolog powers. Uh, so where do we begin in this real world? Um, so Prolog is very, very good at solving puzzles, and Sudoku being a classic example of solving a puzzle. And we can actually implement Sudoku in the type system, uh, but we won't, because uh, no matter how much I tried, I couldn't find any real world use of, for Sudoku, not in the type system or anywhere else. Um, so we'll move on. So anyone who worked with uh, uh, Scala's 2.8 collections uh, probably saw uh, can build from at one point or, or another. And it can look quite intimidating, uh, even earning the title of being a suicide note. Um, but viewed, viewed as a prolog program, it's actually not that scary. Uh, so the actual definition of, uh, of can build from is this. So it says that we can build a collection of type 2 from uh, elements of type lm given a, a, an input of a collection of type from. Um, so uh, so, uh, so we don't actually want to provide those, those can build from instances, uh, instances on our own because there are many different collections and we don't want to kind of define can build from for each and uh, every one of them. So we want to get the compiler to do it for us. So we'll use implicits to get the compiler to derive the can build from instances, instances for us. So these are some examples of can build from implicits. Uh, and it's quite noisy because Scala is not optimized for doing prolog. And so let's move back to prolog. So 
Uh, I find this syntax to be much more kind of compact and getting the point across better. So we can read as follows. So for any value b, we can construct a list of b from a list of a, and same goes for sets. From any b, we can construct a set of b. Uh, bit sets are slightly more complicated. We can construct uh, bit sets from ints, but we cannot construct bit sets for any, uh, any other b, so we can, from a bit set uh, and some type b, we can on only construct uh, sets of b, not bit sets. And sorted sets requ require a rule. So in this case, we say we can construct a sorted set of b from b values given that we have an ordering for b. So in this form, uh, in this form I find it quite readable. And if it was just that, I don't think that the, the hatred of uh, can build from would be so intense. But the problem is that Skull's collection, 2.8 collection, say, um, deprecated, I guess, um, the collection hierarchy is actually quite big. Uh, this is just a sample of the hierarchy, not the whole thing. And implicits for can build from can be found anywhere in this tree and other dimensions. Um, so yes, uh, as a prog program, uh, can build from is quite simple, but it's spread over way too many files to be able to actually easily figure it all out. So the prolog analogy doesn't help all that much here. Okay, so our next, next example is uh, type classes. It's a very useful pattern in Scala, uh, used everywhere pretty much. And I won't go into the details, I just want to take the prolog perspective and kind of analyze it from, from there. Uh, so, um, so this is an example of a type class that lets us take a value of type A and uh, asserts that A can be, uh, can be converted into, j into JSON. And it has a corresponding value level uh, uh, method that actually does the conversion, takes an A and, and provides us with a JSON value. So we can state some facts about it. So we start with prolog uh, straight away. So we say that we can write strings and we can write ints. Uh, as JSON, quite naturally. Next, we say that we can write a list of A's given if we can write A. And the same goes for, uh, for options. Um, next, we can say that we can write tuples of A and B given that if we can write A and we can write B. And we can, so this is, a, this is our knowledge base and we can query it for, for example, for the following. So we're asking uh, whether we can write a list of option of tuple of string and int. By the way, if you have a, a type signature like this in your code, please don't. Um, but that's just an example. So, uh, so we were asking whether we can write a list of options of tuple of string and int, and Prolog now uses this whole knowledge base, goes over it, and says, yes, we can, because uh, we, we can chain the various definitions and trace it through and find, uh, find out how to write uh, this complex value. And now we can go back to Scala. So again, we do the conversion uh, mechanically as before. So we start with capitalization. Uh, next, we mark the facts as implicit. Uh, we reverse the if operator and mark it implicit as well. So again, we re read it in rever reverse. So we can write a list of A given that we can write uh, A. And now we just complete into full scale definitions. Uh, and again, the names don't really matter for anything. So I don't care that this is called can write string. It just doesn't matter. Uh, but wh what's missing are the values. So previously, we didn't care about the values. We just gave, uh, we just had dummies. But this time we'll, we'll want actually something more useful because eventually we do want to convert values into, into JSON. And so we'll actually implement the value level behavior. So for example, we can, uh, uh, so the implementation of can write of a string just takes a string and wraps it with a JSON, uh, the corresponding JSON constructor. Uh, the list rule is slightly more complicated. So it says, given that we can write uh, A, we can write a list of A. And how do we do it? We use the, this proof that we can write A to actually convert each value inside of our list of values into a JSON value, and then we wrap the whole thing in, in the JSON array constructor. And we can do it similarly, we can do the same thing for the, the other definitions. And now we can, once we do that, we can query the compiler just as in prolog. So in this case, we're asking whether, whether we can write a list of options uh, of a tuple of string and int, and the compiler says yes, it compiles, but also it provides us with a value, this specific value. And since we, we were careful to implement our can write instances properly, we followed the logic and actually do, uh, did the, the JSON conversion, we can uh, actually use this instance to do something useful uh, at runtime. So we now can provide it with an actual value and get a real JSON out of it. Uh, so we managed to tie our type-level computation to a useful value-level result. Uh, so the, the code for this can write instance, so this, that thing here, we never actually wrote it. Uh, it's something that the compiler derived, so we just taught the compiler some facts and rules, and the compiler went ahead and just derived this whole value for us. So it's code that we don't have to maintain, the compiler just does it for us. 
And this is something that happens a lot when, uh, when using type classes. And I think that tracing the process with, with this prolog analogy can sometimes help. So this example wasn't that complicated, but some examples are more involved in, and using this prolog mentality can, I think, can help tracing, uh, tracing the logic behind it. So now we're ready for our um, last example. So how many people here are famil familiar with Docker Streams? Okay, so I won't be going into the details of Aqua Streams, but I want just one high-level concept from it. So one of the things that uh, Aqua Streams lets us do is, is describe uh, uh, high-level flows of the uh, data, like, like this thing. So in this case, we have some source of the data. We, we broadcast it in two different channels, merge it, and then have some output. And all the Fs here are uh, flows that possibly transform the, the inputs into something else. And starting with from this uh, diagram, uh, Acostrius provides us with a DSL that lets us convert uh, this to into actual code that does something uh, with actual uh, 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 flowing data in our system. So we started with some boilerplate, uh, boilerplate which I won't be explaining now. Uh, now, first we need to declare our, our stages. So we have a source and a sync. So it's the in and out. Uh, one produces values, the other consumes them. Uh, next, we have to, uh, the, the broadcast and merge stages, so we just declare those. Uh, now we have some flows, so each flow uh, applies some transformation over the input. So, in, for example, the second flow takes some number and converts it into a string and outputs it in this way. And we can now build the graph that we had on the previous slide. So the syntax is meant to be a kind of a straightforward translation uh, of the diagram from before. So, so we're saying that if, uh, an outlet from the source is connected into, into this flow and similarly for the rest of the squiggly arrows. And this, uh, I find it actually quite nice because it, it's quite easy to go get back to the original diagram and, and figure out what, what this flow does. But we're not done yet. Uh, the DSL, uh, so this thing tells the DSL that uh, we're dealing with a closed shape. So that is, each port on every stage is connected uh, to exactly one other, uh, one other uh, port from another stage. And this bothers me, bothers me because uh, this is just an assertion. It's not a proven fact. Suppose that we forget to connect something. So if we omit some, I don't know, the merge stage uh, at the end here, we fail at runtime with an exception. Uh, so we just asserted something that wasn't checked until runtime. Uh, but that's exactly uh, what, what we have types for, to catch this, these things at compile time for us, so we don't have to deal with the exceptions later on. So what we really want uh, is a type-safe uh, closed shape, or light band closed shape, I don't know. Uh, such that uh, if, we build, uh, if we build a graph from uh, our type-safe closed shape value, it will never fail at runtime. But uh, imag imagine that, that type. Imagine how will you encode such a complicated invariant in a single type that actually captures this whole logic of being a closed shape. So constructing values of this can a closed shape, uh, type safe closed shape uh, value will by, by hand, so to speak, uh, is quite difficult. But now that we know Prolog, uh, we, can get the com we can make the compiler do it for us. So a Prolog program that actually proves uh, that a shape is closed is actually not that complicated. Uh, so we'll write the, the Prolog program and then convert it, or at least get inspired by it, uh, and convert it back to Scala and re hopefully regain uh, back type safety. So we start with declaring the various ports. So we have inlets and outlets. So this says that uh, the sync stage has a port named one that, that produces, uh, uh, that consumes a string. And the second, uh, an outlet says that we have a, s uh, this, this line says that we have a source stage that, uh, uh, that has an outlet named one that consumes an int. And similarly for the other uh, stages. And next we want to connect the various stages one to, uh, to one, one to another. So uh, a connect node says that we're in this case connecting the number one outlet of source into the number one inlet of flow one. Uh, and similarly for the rest of the connections. And before we can actually prove that this forms a closed shape, the, the whole graph of connections, we'll need some, uh, some helpers. Um, so this rule uh, lets us compute all of the ports that are associated with the stage. So given some, some stage, we want uh, this uh, variable to contain all the ports that this stage has. So this find all function in Prolog does something quite magical. Uh, it finds all the, the uh, assignments of variables into this expression that make this expression true. So in this case, and then puts it in, in, a, in a list. So in this case, we find all the inlets of, of stage and all the outlets in stage, put both of them into a list, and then append it into one single list of, uh, of, of ports. 
So for example, uh, given uh, the stage broadcast, uh, we can find all of the ports that, are, uh, that this broadcast has, uh, has so far. Uh, next, we'll need another helper that uh, a rule that given a list of stages finds all the ports for that, for that list of stages. So for, for an empty list uh, of stages, we have no ports, so that's not a problem. Next, we have a non-empty list. We, we have a head and a tail. We want, uh, uh, we want to collect. What we do is we collect all the stages for the head and assign it into the head ports variable, then recursively find all the ports for the tail, and then uh, and assign it to the tail ports uh, argument, a variable, and then we concatenate the two into a single result. So it's a recursive definition, but it's, if you trace it at home, probably not all that complicated, I hope. It actually works. So given a list of, uh, of two stages, we find all the ports that are associated uh, with, the, with the stages, and now we're ready to define our uh, closed shape uh, rule. So the, the rule takes two arguments. The first argument is the list of ports we're checking and the, uh, the current list of ports we're checking. And the second argument uh, is the full list of ports we have in our system. Uh, will be useful in, in a moment. So uh, in case we have no ports at all, it's obviously closed because no ports are closed. Uh, next we look at the non-empty list. So uh, if we have uh, a list that's not empty and the head of the list is an outlet, so it's an outlet of some type, we find the inlet with the corresponding type we ver verify that the outlet and inlet are connected. Uh, we make sure that it happens, we wrap it, wrap it in an exactly once function, which makes sure that we, we don't find multiple results because we can't connect the same outlet into multiple uh, inlets. Uh, and then we verify that the, in the, the inlet we found is a member of the whole, the, the full ports list because we don't want to connect into an external port somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the program. And then we recursively check that the tail is also closed. Uh, now, similarly, we can do the same thing for if we have an inlet as the head, uh, as the head of the list. So it's the same definition, but with the inlet and outlet uh, reversed. Uh, so uh, pretty much the same. And we'll add one last rule just to make it slightly more convenient to use. It's just an overload of the closed shape uh, functor that takes a list of stages, finds all the ports for that list of stages, and then verifies that the ports of the list of stages is, is indeed closed within the full list of ports, which is that list we just found. And we're done. So we can actually query this thing. So here's the here's the full list of ports, that, uh, full list of stages that we had so far, and uh, it is a closed shape. But if we uh, omit something uh, like this, uh, then in this case we um, we're missing flow two, and in this case the shape is not closed anymore. So with this code as inspiration, we can actually solve uh, the Scala problem that we stated before. So first we need to declare all the types up front. Some people are scared from of types that are, have numbers in them, or like this, but I don't know. So we declare the, the various ports we have, so one and two. Um, so just the port numbers. Uh, next, we have a type for stages. We'll be using it later. And uh, now we have uh, types for inlets and outlets. So it's an inlet that has a stage, uh, some, uh, some specific port, and a type that uh, actually flows through that uh, inlet. And since we, we will need some useful value level behavior, we'll wrap it uh, in an inlet. We, we're wrapping an inlet value that we can use later on. And the same thing goes for an outlet with an outlet value. Uh, next, we, we need to define a, a, connect, uh, uh, a connect predicate. So we're saying that O and I are connected, so given that they have the same type. And we also have the, the value level uh, equivalence of, uh, of the outlet and the inlet. Now, in, at uh, this point in the prolog program, we defined a rule that to find all the ports of a stage. Uh, but as I mentioned before, imp uh, implicits can't resolve multiple values for the same invocation. So we can't write this rule like we did uh, in prolog, but instead we'll have to compromise and specify the ports uh, of each stage directly on, on the stage, just manually. So unfortunate, but, but what can you do? So we're adding a type member to each stage. So each stage is, uh, has a list of ports uh, that belongs to that stage. Uh, and now we can actually write the rule to find all the ports for a list of stages. So, uh, so we're saying that given a list of stages, we want to find the list, uh, 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 an H list of all the ports that uh, the list of stages has. Um, so we pretty much follow the prolog definition. So we say that for uh, an empty list of ports, uh, an empty list of stages, we have an empty list of ports. Uh, that's simple. Uh, next, we have a rule for non-empty lists. Now, the type signature is quite scary. Uh, I think, maybe. Uh, not the scariest yet, by the way. Uh, uh, so 
Uh, but keep in mind the parallel code, and hopefully that makes it clear. So ignore this because this is noise. We're just uh, declaring upfront uh, all the variables that we, we need to use. Uh, so what we're saying is the following. So uh, given that we have uh, all the uh, all the, all the ports for uh, a detail of a list uh, of stages, we take the ports of the head, which is here, and append it to the, uh, to the tail. And this is the result. Okay, so we just recursively go over the list of stages and collect all the ports into a single list. And uh, now with this, uh, with this rule in hand, we can define the closed shape type. So the closed shape type says that we, given a list of ports, uh, it is closed within the, the, list, the full list of ports. Uh, but since we actually want, uh, eventually want to construct an actual runtime graph that we can use and run a real stream uh, in, uh, in, at runtime, we'll, we're adding a value level method here, uh, a, list that, uh, a list that contains all the connected nodes, uh, all the connected, uh, connected uh, inlets and outlets that we have in our system uh, within this closed shape. And, and the invariant we're trying to keep is that if we use this list to construct an actual graph, it will never fail at runtime um, uh, as not being closed. So, uh, and we're going to use our prolog program to enforce this invariant. So again, we start with the empty case. So we're saying that a, an empty list of ports is, is, is closed within any, uh, within any uh, list of uh, uh, other ports. So in this case, we're saying the list of connections is also empty. So we're mimicking uh, the type level with the value level definition. Uh, next, uh, there's the case of a non-empty list, which is now this one is the scariest piece of code we have so far. So more type members, so just kind of we need to fade out th that part and kind of focus on this one. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, but it's actually very, very similar. If, if you ignore the noise, it's actually very, very similar to the prolog code we had before. So if you keep the prolog uh, in front of you, at least mentally, uh, then you can probably follow along. So what we're saying is that we have uh, a, a list. Uh, uh, so we have a list of uh, ports So and that has a head. The head is O. Uh, and we're saying that Okay, let's find uh, a connection between this outlet and some uh, inlet. Verify that the inlet is a member of all of our uh, of the full list of ports, and then recursively uh, verify the, the the rest of the list of ports. And this recursively goes over the list of uh, the full list of ports and kind of uh, verifies that everything is connected to everything. And the main difference here is that we don't have the exactly once uh, thing that we had before when we checked the connection, because in Scala implicit can resolve only once or not at all. So there's no risk of having multiple connections uh, for the same uh, component. And, and now, uh, because we're, uh, we actually want a value level uh, uh, definition, we implement the connections method with an actual list of, uh, of things. So we're mimicking uh, the same sort of uh, structure we had at the type level. So we're taking the head connection and adding it to the tail, and just like we did here uh, before. And if we do it consistently, we'll actually get a valid list of connections uh, by the end of uh, compilation. And uh, we can do the same thing for uh, inlets at the head of the, uh, of the list, but I'll skip it because it's quite the same. And you can see the full code uh, later on. And uh, now we just need to wrap up uh, with a kind of helper function to do the work for us. So we're saying that given uh, some stages, uh, what w uh, we want to find all the ports uh, for these stages, and this is the ports list. We verify that, that these ports are closed within that full list of ports. So we have a closed shape value, which is a proof that we, we, we are dealing with an actual closed shape. And now uh, we're actually implementing some value level be behavior. So given that we have a closed shape value, we actually have a list of connections. Now we know because we constructed the prolog program in, uh, in a certain way that this list is, is definitely closed. And so we can now connect all of them using the AquaStreams DSL and it's guaranteed to be closed. So when we actually run this thing, uh, it will be safe. So we can now safely assert uh, the original closed shape value from Akka. Uh, now it's not just an assertion, it's actually proved at compile time by this closed shape value here. And so we uh, converted our compile time uh, proof, which was this, into a compile time value, which is this assertion plus the actual connections that we are making uh, using the connections list. And we can, uh, after some more wiring, and the full wiring is available again at, at the repo, uh, we can define some, uh, some stages and we can uh, define the various connections. So we're saying what's connected to what. Again, a bit noisy, but still kind of prology. And then we can gather the whole list of stages into a single list and compile it. And it compiles. And you can now believe me that it actually works. I'm even not going to bother, bother running it. Uh, 
But on the other hand, if I omit something, so in this case I omitted the flow for part here, uh, if I try to build this, it fails at compile time. It says the list is not closed. And this is exactly what we wanted. So we managed to regain type safety using some kind of prolog analogy with uh, implicits. And this completes, uh, completes the example. Um, and you can see the full code for the whole thing uh, at the repo. And you may be now thinking, or maybe not, um, that we're actually writing kind of very non-trivial code uh, that runs at compile time. And so this is an actual, com uh, an actual program uh, that, uh, that, that runs at some point or another, in this case at compile time. And what happens if it doesn't work? So can we debug it in some way? Um, I mean, it's, it's not impossible to debug implicit resolution, but it's quite difficult. So there are, there are various, uh, various options. So we have the xlog implicit flag, uh, which kind of prints out the whole implicit resolution process. Uh, it, does, it prints out everything, so it's quite, quite noisy and hard to read. There's also the Splain compiler plugin, which tries to prettify the output and make something more useful. Also, in recent IntelliJ versions, there, uh, there's, there are implicit hints, which are very useful in that they're actually showing the, the implicit chain uh, in the editor, and so you can kind of follow along and jump into the source, and, and it can help tracing uh, the whole process. Uh, but I and it, it, it all helps to some extent, but uh, it still remains quite difficult uh, to debug anything. Uh, for example, this is the output from xlog implicits from our last example. Um, and it just runs along and yeah. So, um, so we've seen, that, uh, we've seen how implicit resolution is, is a lot like Prolog and that we can use this similarity to better understand uh, code that uses implicits, uh, like, uh, like the usage of type classes or various libraries like shapeless. Um, by using prolog as a notation, so as a notation for type level programming, we can make these, these program, uh, programs easier to follow. So it's not one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's still kind of easier. Uh, and you can use these skills uh, either in your own code or when trying to figure out some libraries, uh, as I said, shapeless. Uh, but there are also downsides, as always. So the the resulting code can be quite scary, even if you keep the prolog code in mind, because, well, it is scary. I can't deny that. And implicit resolution is not really prolog, because there are, we saw some discrepancies, and there, there are more. It's not the only thing. Um, so, for example, we can't infer multiple values for the same implicit, which is quite uh, essential in prolog. Uh, and every time you do something non-trivial with implicits, you risk skyrocketing your compile times. At some point in this example that I had uh, with Aka Streams, I had the exponential um, compile times or something, which I don't know how it came there, how it disappeared, no idea. Uh, and this can be a real problem. So in a real code base where, where you have lots of implicits, that this can be a real non-trivial problem to solve. And uh, so it's very, very easy to abuse these techniques. Uh, so think very, very carefully before you introduce something like this in your own code base uh, for real work. Uh, so nonetheless, on a more optimistic note, uh, I do find the prolog analogy very helpful, especially in the use case of type classes where I try to mentally kind of process a flow of, uh, of implicits that construct a type class uh, value. And uh, it actually helps me on a daily basis. So. I do hope you find it uh, useful to some extent. And the full presentation can be found here with the slides, notes, and the full code. And thank you.